morning you for coming to the Modeling Immunity Workshop. We have a day packed full of talks and discussion panels, and we hope for some fruitful discussion today. Um, very happy to have uh, the meeting hosted by the Fields Institute, the Modeling for Public Health, and CERC EIDM Network. And I think that what we'll do first before I start going through some of the ground rules and, and the introduction, we can have some opening remarks. Um, and first, I'm very happy to welcome Kumar Murthy, who's the director of the Fields Institute. Thanks, Jane. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, uh, what you're uh, proposing to do today and um, in the days to come, I think, um, is very important work. Um, we are more than a year into this pandemic and still so many um, questions unanswered and uh, requiring uh, study. Um, so I'm delighted that all of you are coming together to, to deliberate on this. Uh, maybe by say a few words about the Institute and the Mathematics for Public Health uh, program. Uh, many of you perhaps know the Institute because you might have participated in our other programs, but we are uh, about 30 years old. We are a research institute for uh, mathematical sciences, and we interpret mathematical sciences in the broadest possible sense. Uh, we are funded by uh, NSERC, um, and by the National Science Foundation and by the province of Ontario and the Simons Foundation and a bunch of uh, individual donors as well. We have about 10 principal, uh, uh, 20 actually, uh, principal sponsoring and affiliated universities and also a principal uh, affiliated institute, the National Research Council, uh, uh, which is uh, developing a, a growing uh, partnership, a research partnership with the Field Institute. Uh, we are committed since the start of the pandemic, the Field Institute has decided it's going to play a, a, a leadership role in um, the reaction or response to the Institute, at least as far as mathematical modeling is concerned. Um, and that's gone through various stages of evolution. But right now, as Jane said, we have a major project, one of the EIDM projects on mathematics for public health. And um, I would like to see that project succeed very uh, tremendously and even grow into something permanent at the Institute, uh, that the Fields Institute would always host uh, a group doing mathematics for public health. Um, and while I say Fields Institute, I should say this is actually a national effort. I, I'm very, one of the most um, things that made me very happy about our approach to this was that uh, all of the math research institutes in Canada are involved. So uh, PIMS, Pacific Institute for Mathematical Sciences, the Centre de Recherche Mathematique, and the Atlantic Association for Research in Mathematical Sciences joined with fields um, to host this. And I see in the today's program, you've got speakers from across Canada, as well as people from uh, outside Canada as well. So that's, that's really excellent. I think it's going to require all of us to work together to make uh, in, in necessary progress on, on these difficult questions. I see you have a really packed schedule. You guys are serious, that's great. Um, um, you only have half an hour break for lunch and you go straight through <laughs> to, to sometime late in the day. I guess that's something that's only possible for virtual meetings. And by the way, you only have one bio break in the whole day. <laughs> so that's pretty intense. So good luck to you on all your conversations and discussions. I'll uh, try and come whenever I can uh, spare some time. We have a huge grant application due tomorrow. So that's going to occupy my time today. Um, but other than that, I will try to drop in whenever I can. And also your talks will be archived, so we'll be able to listen to them afterwards as well. Uh, if you need anything to make your uh, uh, work uh, easier, uh, please do reach out to us. We have a, uh, excellent, excellent staff. Zara is on the call. She is uh, constantly monitoring everything that's happening in the workshop and Kirsten is also available. So please do avail of that. We want your uh, interaction here to be as fruitful and as pleasant as possible. Um, so once again, welcome and uh, best of luck in, our, in, your, in all the discussions today. Thank you so much, Kumar. We're very happy to be hosted by the Fields Institute and uh, we're very thankful for all of the support that the Fields Institute has provided for the workshop, including uh, all of the video conferencing, as well as any of the technical issue help um, and posting the website and and formatting and helping to advertise, so thanks so much. Um, we're also very happy to have uh, a lot of co-organizers and uh, from different institutes and different uh, research networks, and I'll, I'll introduce them later, but particularly we're also very happy to have um, the Canadian Immunity, COVID Immunity Task Force uh, represented in 
in the organizing committee. And uh, we have some opening remarks from David Beckridge. Thanks, David. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jane. And it's a pleasure to be uh, supporting uh, or helping to organize the, the workshop uh, and to be associated with uh, the, the fine schedule as Kumar pointed out for today. Um, just to say a few words, the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force, those of you might not be aware, it's a federally funded organization in Canada. It's a group of volunteers that form the task force and there's a secretariat based at McGill University. Uh, and we're in the second year of our mandate now. Uh, the main point of the mandate really is to support generation and uh, transfer into action of knowledge about immunity in relation to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, we've gone through a series of different research foci. We're on to our third phase of research right now and modeling uh, with the support of Jane and others that you'll hear from today figures quite prominently in the work of the task force, uh, both as a way to uh, answer fundamental questions but also to integrate uh, data that's coming out of different sources. So we have work underway, both in terms of more statistical uh, modeling to try to estimate the current level of immunity to SARS-CoV-2 in the population and also more focused uh, scenario based within host and between host population modeling work that uh, very relevant to the work that the COVID-19 task force uh, is doing and uh, delighted to be associated with this uh, workshop today. So I'll uh, keep the remarks short, but uh, again, thank you very much, Jane, for being, allowing us to be a part of this. And I look forward to uh, hearing all the great uh, research discussed today. Thank you, David. Um, so I'm going to share some slides. So we're very happy to have everyone here and I'm going to ah, there we go. So everyone can see my screen? Yes. Yeah, okay, thanks. So welcome everyone to the modeling immunity workshop. Uh, this workshop, as I said before, is uh, supported by the Mathematics for Public Health and Circuit EIDM network as well as the Fields Institute. And it's supported by the Center for Disease Modeling, Centre de la Modernisation des Maladies, uh, the COVID Immunity Task Force, the National Research Council of Canada, uh, NSERC, the Omni Reuni NSERC EIDM network, and by all of you. And we're very happy to have speakers from all over Canada, um, as well as from the United States, from France, um, Australia, and we have participants from all over the world as well. And that's something that an online meeting can, can do is uh, allow for people to easily um, uh, participate in different meetings at different countries um, without having to worry about traveling and, and big budgets. So today we're gonna to talk about modeling immunity. And this is something that I, that I think about a lot, all the time, really. Um, so we're interested in looking at immunity as a whole, and, and what does that really mean? So what you'll see is that today we're going to have um, talks from people who look at in-host modeling. So looking at questions about uh, immunity and the buildup of immunity and so on uh, in the individual. So looking at in-host modeling or mathematical immunology. And then we also have people talking about immunity at the population level and, and what that really, really means. But you can think about immunity as really having two main factors uh, in this feedback loop from the individual to the population. And one is that immunity will affect your susceptibility. And that's when your, your walking around in a population and you have uh, contacts during the day. Uh, so your immune system is going to affect your susceptibility. But as well as if you, if you end up getting sick, then your immune response is also going to affect your transmissibility of the pathogen back into the population. So, when we talk about immunity, we, we often talk about it in, at a population level. We also talk about it at a, an individual level. So when we talk about getting vaccinations, we all know individuals go get the vaccines, but vaccination programs are also rolled out at the population level. So when we talk about immunity, we're always talking about individuals and populations at the same time. So when we're interested in modeling immunity, 
we're interested in looking at different pathogens and so um, looking at the development of immunity uh, against different that? pathogens like COVID-19 or influenza. And uh, we are also interested in looking at how uh, immunity builds up uh, from vaccination. And then of course, we're interested in looking at how um, different drug therapies can also affect the development and persistence and, and aid of the immune response um, against particular pathogens in the body, whether it be an acute infection like COVID-19 or influenza or a chronic infection like HIV. So something that we also try to do when we're modeling immunity is that we can uh, use these in-host models to quantify um, the symptoms or try to get a measure of a symptomatic infection from in-host models. And, and then when we can do that, that means that we can get an idea of what reporting might, might look like at the population level. So we can get a measure of the severity of symptoms, which then are definitely going to affect how uh, individuals go to the doctor, go get tested for different pathogens uh, or different sicknesses. And then that affects what happens in the reporting level uh, in the population, which then of course informs public health mitigation strategies and more vaccination programs. At the population level, we're interested in looking at the reproduction number. There's the basic reproduction number uh, that we always hear about at the beginning of a pandemic, um, which quantifies how susceptible a population is to a particular pathogen. And then there's the control reproduction number, which is the same thing, except for it's in a population that has some public health mitigation or vaccination control that's going to affect the incidence or um, the incidence or the ability of a pathogen to infect individuals in the population. So again, those, there's, there's two levels of what we're looking at, the in-host immunity and the population level of immunity. And they're of course, intimately linked. So when we talk about immunity, we talk about you know, protection. So here we have an individual that becomes infected with a pathogen. Uh, they mount that initial immune response. And then after this infection or during the infection, they get antibodies. And then they have some buildup of T cell memory or B cell memory and B cell memory at the end of the, of the infection. And so that means that they have some protective capacity so that a few weeks later they get reintroduced to the pathogen, then they can get an inapparent reinfection or they have a total um, uh, neutralizing immunity which blocks infection entirely. Uh, when, or, and then you can look at what happens years later, they still have some immune memory, hopefully, um, and then they uh, can be reintroduced to the pathogen, they are, they're exposed and they, again, might have a neutralizing immunity which allows them to resist being infected, or they might get a mild or inapparent reinfection, reinfection, which allows their immune system to be boosted in immune memory. And it could be a very mild reinfection, so asymptomatic or mild symptoms. And we've all experienced these effects um, with respect to immunity in our, every, in our every year lives. Okay. But something that we also need to consider is that immunity might also, after it accumulates after an infection or a vaccination, it can wane over time for, uh, against particular pathogens. And this is related to um, not necessarily just immunity decaying in the body, but it can also be related to effective immunity or quantifications of effective immunity and how they accumulate and then decay over time with respect to evolution. So here you can think, well, here's an individual that maybe had an exposure to influenza and they got infected. And then um, the effective immunity wanes. And so then a few years later, the pathogen has evolved significantly so that they can be infected again and they get another infection and so on. Um, and we look at how the immune response um, and how the distributions of immunity against a particular pathogen and many variants and many strains can accumulate in the body. You can also look at how um, immunity might wane after you have a vaccination. So here you have that initial vaccine that you might get against a particular pathogen in the childhood uh, vaccination program. And then a few years later, you can get a booster dose. 
and maybe you can get a booster dose again and again. And we know that for some, some pathogens, the vaccine-induced immunity can also wane over time. And so this type of information is important for us to consider when we're looking at uh, reevaluating uh, vaccination programs against particular pathogens. And also not just reevaluating uh, when, like what particular ages are going to get the vaccine, but also uh, how the vaccine is formulated, for example, for influenza from year to year. Okay. So today we have a pretty packed schedule, as, as Kumar said. Um, in each session, we're going to have three or four speakers, and then we'll have a panel. Um, the panel discussion uh, includes just leftover questions from the talk. So if people have some, some uh, other questions that they weren't able to ask uh, in the allocated time in each half hour time slot. And it can also mean that there could be some general questions to the panel related to the talks uh, with respect to immunity, uh, questions about B cells and T cells or herd immunity and particular pathogens. So this morning, we're very happy to have four speakers and a panel. And then we'll have a half an hour lunch break. And then the afternoon is split into two sessions of three half hour uh, talk slots and panels where we have one health break in between. Um, the scheduling was very different considering different uh, individuals coming from various places around the world. And so we do have a little bit of a focus on European, um, European speakers in the morning. In the afternoon, we have North American and then uh, also some individuals from Australia. So while we're in, in each of these talks. Uh, I'm hoping that everyone's internet will, will be okay for the whole day. Um, but if you're having some internet issues, just please let um, me and Kirsten and maybe Zara know in the chat, uh, private chat or group chat. So for, for all the speakers so that we know uh, if we lose someone, how we might be able to get that person back into the meeting. Okay. So the discussion panels, as I said, can be predominantly uh, looking at uh, questions from the talks that people weren't able to ask previously. Um, you can think too that generally these questions, if we're looking at in-host questions, can, can look at different aspects of B cells and T cells and antibodies, questions about accumulation of immunity and maintenance in the individual, as well as just questions about longevity as a whole, I know for COVID-19, that's a big question that people have right now in terms of um, effective longevity against uh, immunity against infection versus a severe disease. And then, then at the population level, there, there can be questions, of course, regarding herd immunity and the reproduction number, uh, the distribution of immunity, because herd immunity doesn't mean that just everyone has immunity or not. There's distributions of immunity across the population. And of course, longevity of that herd immunity, which is going to affect public health mitigation programs, vaccination programs as well. And so um, we can think about <laughs> the individual effects of vaccination programs and the population level effects. Um, of course, then that means that uh, when we're looking at mitigation of public health uh, mitigation of infectious diseases, this is also going to affect the um, shaping of an individual's immune response because public health mitigation programs affect the contacts or the, um, the transmission probabilities of specific um, pathogens in the population. And so then that of course is going to affect how an individual's immune system sh is shaped from year to year uh, as they as they uh, grow, uh, mature in age and so on in the population, change jobs, et cetera. Okay, so when we look at the effects of the immune response as well as immunity, we can also look at how this is affected by age, sex, and ethnicity. And then again, there's just those individual versus population level considerations. So this is, I expect that in the discussion panels there'll be questions sur surrounding all of these topics. And an important question will be, what do we think are the key questions that 
uh, we should consider in modeling immunity in the host and at the population level uh, going into the future when we uh, can be preparing models of immunity at both levels to get ready for the next pandemic or even just the influenza season. Okay, so some ground rules that we have for uh, the entire day. Uh, the first is to mute your microphone. Um, so that really reduces the background noise and it means that the speaker be, can be heard clearly and recorded clearly um, in the session. Um, you might, uh, you can feel free to turn on or off your video, though it is nice for the speakers to be able to see uh, people while they're, while they're giving their talks. So if you can, um, in your internet bandwidth isn't affected terribly by it, you can turn on your uh, camera, but also know that these talks are being recorded. And so it's possible that we can, that the recording will see you um, during the talk. So also just be, be aware of that. If you have particular questions, feel free to put the questions in the chat um, uh, so that we can have a recording of each question, but also during the question period, we can have questions that are um, spoken. Uh, it's just easier for us to have the questions in the chat for moderation and so that we can keep track of the questions as well for the discussion sessions. Um, overall, uh, to have a respectful environment, we all acknowledge that we all have opinions and opinions don't mean that they're facts. And we all respect other people's opinions and their talks and their research. Uh, going on. And I, I, I'm sure that everything will work out uh, fine today as we're all respectful in this group. Okay, so that's everything for the opening remarks. Uh, our first talk uh, is at nine o'clock, so it's in about seven minutes. So we can have an extra health break before the talks commence at nine. So feel free to go get 